Hi, this is James Connor, and I'm here with Julian Rose, and we're going to talk a little bit about his book and uh, his work in Poland uh, for regular Connor Post readers. Uh, you've, you've seen some of his articles over the last months and even, even I think, the last year. And, yeah, we'll just get right into it. How are you, Julian? Yeah, I'm pretty good, thanks, James, and uh, it's good to speak with you. Uh, I think it's also great. We've never actually done a, a podcast like this before, so I'm excited to explore some different things with you. Um, yes, indeed. In, in, I, I feel I'm rather blessed, actually, because you gave me got a, a very good start in terms of speaking to an audience I didn't have much contact with before. Yeah, well, that's good. And, uh, that, was very, that was very useful, actually. And it's, it's interesting because I think there's a lot of overlap in... in, in, in um, Direction, but I'm, uh, I'm, which is good. I'm, I think there's also different areas where we had different takes on uh, uh, world politics and different areas we're focused on. But that's Certainly. great because otherwise it would be boring. I think. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not a great, as you pointed out, I think in an email you sent me. I'm not a great believer in left and right, other than as indicators. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk in politics about center, left, right, and it doesn't go much deeper. And unfortunately, that game is very often played out by the politicians themselves who uh, like to make claims about being one side or the other. But when it really comes down to it, they rather tend to all have a pretty similar menu. So if you went to a restaurant and it was left and it was right, actually, you would find in the end that are all the typical dishes and nothing very much different. So I'm rather in favor of exploring further, deeper, uh, looking behind the news to see what's really going on. And of course, also, who are the hidden hand players? Because we often take a lot of focus on the ones who are on the screen, on the headlines and what have you, but not the ones who are pulling their strings. I, I agree with that. And, and I have to admit that the left and right dichotomy is so handy because it's so widely used. But in the last year, I've tended more on a personal level, much more to think in terms of of kind of a local, localist versus globalist term. Some people call it nationalist. Some people call it a, a regionalist. Yes. And, but again, these are always broad brushstrokes, so they're never quite perfect economies. Um, before we get into it, maybe, Julian, uh, if you could tell you, the audience how they can get a hold of you or your website again. Yes, certainly. Well, basically, I'm on uh, julian at icppc.pl. That's my personal email address. I'm always very happy for people to drop me a line. And if there's a lot of in common, we can strike up a conversation and possibly even contact. And the website is www.julianrose.info. That's I-N-F-O. Okay, great. And, and for people who didn't have a chance to write that down, it's easy enough to find Julian Rose's contact information over Connor Post. And I, and I have to excuse myself, my boy. I have a little bit of a frog in my throat today. Don't know what to do about that. <laughs> I'm, I'm drinking tea, but bear with me. Uh, Julian Rose sure. is a, 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 an, a, an experienced actor, so I'm going to let him carry the show. Uh, it, <laughs> I just wanted to pick up on what you said about local uh, versus globalists. I actually very much subscribe to that approach because I foresee, uh, as probably people would have picked up from some of my articles already, that we will all be forced into a localist and regional approach ultimately because the globalist one is simply raping and destroying the planet at such a fast rate that we would need, they say, five more planets if the standard of living, quotes of people in the Northern Hemisphere, post-industrial, was to be the same for the whole nine billion of the planet. So the globalist scenario is, is catastrophic, and we are forced back. Of course, I'm a farmer, um, and I'm working in Poland, and I'm working in England with organic farming. I was converting my farm in England back in 1975, by the way, which is probably amongst the very earliest people who adopted organic farming. And it was stepping in the midst of a hail of fire from agrochemical corporations and government. And everyone 
who was concerned with expansion of modern agriculture, said this is us taking a step backwards. And uh, now we're all going to move forward and agrochemicals going to save the world. So I've had many, many years now of this experience. And uh, that went on in England between 1975 and about 2000. And then in 2000, I met Jadwiga Wapata, her, who is a Polish uh, a small scale farmer. She's coming from a small peasant farming background near Krakow, southern Poland. And she'd been very involved in helping to develop something for tourists where they go to farms and stay on genuine organic farms with, that have kept the traditional approach not only on the land but also in their furniture and in their way of life. So uh, tourists can get an authentic experience of traditional life in Poland. Uh, I met her in the year 2000 at an environmental conference in London. And uh, long and the short of that story, because it's a long one, is that she invited me over to Poland and said, I'm setting up an organization called the International Coalition to Protect the Polish Countryside. And I think you might be interested. And I said, I'm very interested. I'm coming. <laughs> that was about three months later. I got on a plane and I landed in Krakow and her son picked me up and took me to the edge of the Tatra, Tatra Mountains, uh, where there was a farmhouse full of people mostly international, because she was very involved with an international activist movement. And uh, they chose, when I wasn't concentrating, I was chosen to be on the board. And uh, I said to Yadviga afterwards, this is going to be difficult, because I'm very, very involved in England on my farm. And she said, no, I don't think so. I think you're going to enjoy this experience. And I said, well, I might be able to come once every three months. She said, no, you'll come for two weeks every month. And, you know, I was so intoxicated by the whole thing, and partly by her as well, that I gave in. And that's the story of how I arrived in Poland. And, uh, and, and from what I understand, both of you, well, they, they, you were working on many issues, but you've also had uh, here and there quite a few moderate to even maybe more than moderate successes dealing with uh, the EU and, and the Polish government. Absolutely so. In fact, you know, well before I got to Poland, I was well aware of the conflicting position, which, for example, farm subsidies were causing with traditional uh, mixed farms in England, uh, where, you know, back 30 or 40 years ago, for let's say 40 years ago now or 50 years ago, there were no subsidies and people were making a reasonable living. And then, of course, everything changed. England got into the European economic marketplace and the common market and we got strapped with this extraordinary subsidy system which has evolved to the point where today you know the more hectares you have of land the more you get paid so what you've got is the big landowners all over europe uh including the people like prince charles the duke of westminster and all these uh, aristocrats who own large areas of land picking up huge subsidies picking up huge subsidies and the small uh, peasants' farms, the small holders, and the traditional mixed farms of around 50, 60 acres or even hectares getting the peanuts. And the whole thing has been so skewed that we're in danger of losing entirely the small-scale mixed farm with all the beautiful biodiversity that goes with it today. And, and in the process of that, I, I assume one of the big issues is that you've been fighting what's so before in England, you you were you had a first your first big campaign was for uh, protecting the right of farmers to sell raw milk. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that was that was extremely interesting. I I just started. Uh, but this is actually back in about 1984, and I had been living and working in in Belgium, where I was involved in an organisation which I helped establish called the Institute for Creative Development. Um, I was involved in experimental theatre at that time, and the theatre company decided we should develop a small school to educate children to have a grasp of dramatic and emotional uh, feelings, as well as intellectual and academic feelings and experiences. And we put these two together, and for a short while, we had a very successful school until we ran out of money. And uh, the parents brought us out and stripped it of its artistic side and just kept its academic side. But the part of that work 
already uh, in in uh, Belgium was introducing me to what was going on in the land there, where they still had workhorses in that time. And I was fascinated by these very small scale farms and the workhorses. And I could see they were doing a very, very good job by comparison to the ever larger scale monocultures all around in Belgium. So when I got back to England, I became increasingly keen to find a way of taking on my a farm, which I never wanted to do. Unfortunately, my older brother was killed in a motor racing accident when I was 16, and my father died of a stroke three years later. And I'm the youngest in the family, two elder sisters, but I inherited the whole thing. Okay, you know, I'm coming from an aristocratic background. We have about a 1,000 acres of land, and a very mixed farm and forestry, small-scale fields, very hilly, poor soil. Beautiful place, but... Very difficult to run financially, very difficult to run altogether, actually. But once I discovered the existence of something called organic farming, uh, I suddenly felt a burst of new light, and I took this on. And one of the first things that happened was I ran into the issue of a potential ban of unpasteurized milk, which which was my lead uh, business on the farm at that time. And um, I hate to drag it away from the core theme of raw milk and and, uh, organic farming, but uh, I am curious. You know, I I read that uh, your – the estate that you inherited uh, was at some point the uh, toad hall from Wind in the Willows. Is that true? (laughs) It is absolutely true, yes. I'm the great-grandson of Mr. Toad. Uh, Uh, that's, that's, That's interesting. I'd wondered about that. The- yes, the how, it, is, it is really true. And um, Kenneth Graham, who is the author of that book, a very famous book for English uh, people, um, he, he used to, he had a cottage in the local village and he used to come regularly to our house and go down and sit by the River Thames and muse on its flow and the rushes and the birds and all the rest of it. And he pretty much dreamt up a lot of wind in the willows while he was there. Yeah, beautiful. yeah, including including Mr. Toad being my great grandfather. Okay, what well, beautiful book! I I remember it vaguely as a child. I'm sure I'll be reading it to my children soon enough as they get a little bit older. The um, you know the the, the so the, the so you learned some activism with the the raw milk uh, campaign, which was successful, and then you know as you've been campaigning in Poland, I think what's interesting for a lot of our listeners and readers at Connor Post is, you know, what did you face in Poland when you were coming from the UK and you were dealing with the bureaucracy bureaucracy and way of things, uh, doing things there? And was that surmount, surmountable in Poland? Or, or I mean, it, you speak uh, or have spoken before Parliament there. How does that Correct. work? Well, it's very interesting, James. Um there is uh, a lot of common, of course, on, which is almost unfortunate between almost all governmental institutions across Europe. Uh, but unfortunately, they're all linked into the Brussels uh, dictatorship, <laughs> I call it. So uh, the difference between countries is getting less and less uh, rather than uh, more individualized and more interesting. But nevertheless, there is a big contrast between the experiences I've had in the House of commons and, and you know, lobbying and that than there is in Poland. And anecdotally interesting is the fact that the first major difference is that you can virtually walk into what is called the same, which is the Polish parliament in Warsaw, with very few checks. And all you need to have is someone uh, who you know, who is uh, either a senator, parliamentarian or whatever, and he just you know, ticks off a a list and says, yes, you can let this person in, you get a badge, and you wander in there. And then you can sort of wander all over it, and nobody bothers you. It's the most extraordinary experience. So you almost immediately feel you're in a sort of family. Now, this is a key factor in when you're living in Poland. Poland is a sort of extended family. It's very, very strong still in its roots, Slavic roots, and in its uh, determination to survive after... Well, over a hundred years of being partitioned, occupied by different countries and having survived Nazism, of course. It's um, very interesting because actually they listen more to foreigners than they do to their own people. And that's sad 
but it happens to be true. So when I first arrived, I I used my title, which I don't often use, as you know, I use it occasionally when I feel it's useful, but I thought it might be useful in Poland. I used it, and also the fact that I had an acquaintance with Prince Charles. And Jadwiga jumped on these issues and thought this is we might get somewhere with that. And the doors flew open, you know. And it wasn't long before we got right up to the top uh, people in the civil service particularly in um, in Warsaw uh, because what we were really campaigning for from the beginning was the maintenance of the small traditional farmer as the key to the survival of good quality food, biodiversity and decent human health. I mean, that is utterly dependent upon small and medium-sized traditional farms. Immediately you get into the agrochemical monocultures, you're in crap food and disease and sickness and people losing you know, their minds. So we were at the forefront of our campaigning was that. But the major issue which I was worried about the day I arrived to take on work, actual work in Poland, was to stop GMO getting in. So we launched, Ludwiga and I, an extraordinary campaign. It, re- it was extraordinary. I hope no one will think I'm boasting. But we decided, and it was largely based on experiences I'd had in England, not to go for central government, but to go for regional government and convince the board members of the regional government that they were going to lose their status as uh, beautiful, tourist-friendly areas providing good traditional Polish food. And their international reputation would be gone if it was recognized that they were allowing genetically modified food to be grown there. So uh, we started with one of the eastern provinces of Poland, Podkopacza, and through a contact of Jadwigus, who was was actually on his way to Parliament but not there yet, we managed to get that particular board interested in this idea. And when they went to the vote, they decided, yes, we're going to buy this and we're going to declare our state. The GMO free zone. And you can imagine, we were extremely bucked by this. And we immediately jumped on and said, okay, now let's try Malpolska, where we live, where Krakow is, and bring one of the board members from uh, Podkopacza over to tell why they did it in front of the board of the, uh, of the Malpolska province. And this happened, and Malpolska went as well. And very soon, this was in 2004, very soon it spread, state by state by state. We were pushing a course like mad as well. It became adopted by the then government, PIS, the same government that's in, part, in party today in Poland. It became adopted as a sort of ticket, political ticket even. And by 2006, we had the whole of Poland GMO free. But these were self-declarations, you understand. They weren't by law passed by the state. So then we said to the chair people of these committee, of these provincial committees, write to the prime minister and say, you want a law passed to ban the, in the import and planting of GMO. All the board members wrote, and that act was passed in the spring of 2006. And Poland became the first country in Europe to ban genetically modified organisms. That's a, that's a huge, huge success by any standards. And I wonder, <laughs> so that was 2006, but yeah. the, the, the likes of Monsanto and these large uh, companies that want to introduce GMOs, what's the status now? Is, 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 are, are your successes in danger? Do you feel like, uh, do you have some confidence that, that nothing is going to get changed anytime soon? It's very interesting, really, because, you know, this really woke up the lion's den, as you can imagine. And those big corporations are clearly furious. They thought they had Poland easily. You know, they thought, no, well, no one really knew, you know, about GMO. So what we educated quite a large swathe of the public in a fairly short time, that it was a disaster. And they didn't take much need, they didn't need much educating. They immediately picked up on it because they're very intuitive. And they love beauty and they're very heart orientated people in Poland, you know. They're not very head orientated, they're very heart orientated. So they picked up the fact that we were passionate about the country and wanted to save it, and they liked this very much. Uh, what happened really was that the backlash started pretty quick. In fact, it was a very remarkable situation, even earlier than this. 
when uh, we went to Brussels at the behest of the leading civil servant to meet the team negotiating Poland's entry into the European Union. Now, people will not probably remember when that was, but that was in 2004. And we went in 2001 to meet the committee responsible for planning this. And it was a shock. We went to the, you know, the European Commission and we met uh, eight people sitting in a room, none of whom were Polish, with one chair lady looking very annoyed that what on earth were we doing there? But we were sent by this high civil servant and they had to listen to us. And uh, well, I said to her, look, it's, it's a disaster because our country's already lost all its best farmers. France has lost all its best farmers, Germany has. And uh, it's all going downhill and getting bigger and worse and more agrochemicals and we're destroying everything. How are we going to prevent this happening in Poland? And there was an absolute silence. You know, you, you could have heard a pin drop. Eventually, she said, I don't think you understand what the objective of the European Union is, <laughs> European agricultural, uh, the, the CAP, Common Agricultural Policy. So I said, the, well, tell me. The thing is, you, said, pro you probably understood oh too well. Yeah, absolutely that. She told me, she said, well, basically, it's to create parity between the wages of people and white-collar workers in the city and farmers. And it's impossible to create parity of wages unless you uh, amalgamate all the small farms into large, competitive, globalized, uh, capable of um, selling their produce on the global marketplace. That was the end of the story. So I said, how are you going to achieve that? She said, well, our objective is to get one million farmers off the land in the next 10 years. I ru we rushed back to Poland with this information, went straight to the, to the House of Parliament, and I was giving a speech next to the Minister of Agriculture in 2001, warning everybody that this is what's going to happen unless you watch out. Well, already then, six months later, that government had gone. The flag of the European Union was erased everywhere. The papers were full of stories of pots of gold that were going to come to the public. And we, we, you know, we could see that we, there was not a chance that Poland was going to vote against joining the EU. And that was back in 2004. So when you got this situation in 2006, when we won this campaign, there was a massive backlash. And the same thing happened again. The government was out in six months. And the next one that got in was looking to do a deal with the corporations to sneak GMO in via the back door. So actually, our work really for the last oh, 10, 11 years since 2006 has been harder than the initial campaign. It's been to stop them sneaking it in through the back door. And we just about succeeded. But I tell you, in a few days' time, we're off to the Parliament again to try and block another act which is trying to do that very thing, to open the back door. Well, my understanding is that, uh, I'm not sure if it's specifically to Poland, but the push is to try and get GMO grains in for animal feed, and that yeah. would be used as a wedge to... Uh, further push GMOs. Well, really, this is very interesting. In 2006, President Kaczynski, actually, who was killed in the air crash in Smolik, um, his kid brother is the one who's currently running the PIS, his channel of it, but uh, he basically decided under pressure from us and many other campaigners that they would also ban GM animal feed, and he did ban it, but he said, I'm going to give two years allowance for farmers to be able to change their ways. And would you believe that two-year allowance is still going on today? It's just been racketed forward year after year after year after year. So we're still looking. Now we're looking at 2020. And, the, I, you know, we're no nearer getting that through in spite of the fact that the act was actually passed to ban GM animal feed. And... Um... So it's interesting. You mentioned the PIS uh, at the Connor Post. No one here except you uh, really reads Polish, but uh, we've been uh, reporting fair, uh, fair, fairly favorably on them. Uh, you work with them. Do you have a good working relationship with them? Have you had uh, better relationships with other uh, governments in Poland? Um, well, good question. Actually, we don't have a very good working relationship with them. We have a just about possible one, but it's been slipping fast in the last two years because they are cheating everybody in, in the way that governments always do, especially once they feel they've got a lot of power and they got in with a big majority last time in and they're 
you know, splashing around the, the, the power end of the political spectrum and they're causing a lot of chaos, actually, in Poland. Um, unfortunately, they're also very closely wedded to the church. And th this combination is very, very difficult to penetrate uh, because Polish people are extremely uh, tied in with the Catholic faith and they believe fervently in Mother Mary and Jesus, and which is fine and all to be recommended. But uh, unfortunately, there's also a great deal of dogma and there's also a great deal of power play. And so that is extremely difficult to break through this, this sort of cabal at the top end of government, which is linked in with the right wing element of the church. Uh, we are working most closely with a, with a small political party called Kukish 15. Kukish is a uh, rock star. He suddenly appeared on the scene at the last elections and announced he wanted to change the political system the way elections worked. He wanted to be more like England, less like Poland. He was pretty articulate and he said he hated GMO and stuff like this. And just before the election, a few weeks before the election, he was carrying about 20% of the whole of the vote in Poland, which shows you how people were fed up with all the other parties because he didn't have a great deal to say, Kukish. But what happened was he, he got in with, with he got about um, 50 uh, MPs in, he got about 12% of the vote. And, and the the chairman of the Agricultural Committee was chosen from his party, a man called Yaroslav Sahaiko. And we pushed hard with Yaroslav Sahaiko, and we got on pretty well with him. And in fact, today, we're working hand in hand with him to try and force the GMO Act, which is being pr proposed by PIS, to be blocked. And we're also trying to force through an act which will allow small and medium-sized family farmers to sell their food which they process in their farmhouses locally and through shops and restaurants. Because in Poland, you can't do it. It's one of the only countries in Europe which has banned that. And that is probably at the behest of huge agrochemical corporations who want to you know, supply the big supermarket chains and the supermarket chains themselves, indeed. Yep. And, and so uh, in broad terms, it sounds like this Kokish is... Uh it reminds me a little bit of what you said, a little bit like uh, Beppo Grillo or Beppe Grillo in, with the Five Star Movement in Italy. Yes, yes, indeed, actually, that, that is quite similar. And you see that throughout Europe and North America, people are extremely skeptical about uh, the institution called government because government could work, something called democracy could, I think, nearly work or possibly even work if the quality of the individuals involved in it was of a reasonable uh, standard. But what's happened in the last uh, 30 or 40 years is that it's gone downhill and downhill and downhill. So now you've simply got people who pose. And actually, they, they're good actors, aren't they? You know, And the substance of the thing is that it's globalization, it's money, and it's power, and it's domination over the people, whether it's left or right or whatever you call it. So these smaller scale uh, quite often coming from the arts, people who suddenly emerge on the platform, people are really curious and interested and, and want them to succeed because they've had enough of the standard uh, status quo politics of the day. So it sounds it, it sounds generally from from uh, well from your reading your stuff and publishing your stuff, and I have the impression that most of your work is in Poland. But you still probably have a pretty good perspective of these issues in the UK. And so where's well, GMO in the UK right now? Yes, I do actually spend most of the time in, in Poland. Actually, what I do is we, we have about six, seven weeks in Poland and then two weeks in England all the year round and going to and fro like that. And, well, that's, I think it'd have to be another podcast because I've got a whole story to tell people about what I've succeeded in doing with the traditional country of state in England, how I sort of moved it out of its more static upper class domain and have opened it up to a lot of other people who are more grounded and more working people. And that, that's a whole other story in itself. But I've got a very good team now, which I've managed to uh, work with over many, many years, and I can be away a lot and communicate by email, and things are running pretty well over there. So actually, it's a, it's a good way of... Um, managing things that is made possible really by the use of things like the internet and emails, etc. So, um, uh, yeah, I'd be fine to break that out into a little bit more of a, um, a podcast focus on the UK. The, 
I would be curious, though, uh, you know, looking at the various things you've written about, it, it's regionalism, it's anti-GMO uh, 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 vaccine skeptic, or maybe even anti-vax, I'd, I'd say anti-vax, it, but, but certainly against these monolithic uh, corporations that have, uh, how would you phrase it, that basically have taken the soul out of all the the, the food production, the, the health care. Absolutely that, exactly that. You know, we were writing, we were in this issue about vaccinations a little bit back, and, and you pushed that pretty hard in various avenues quite correctly yeah. because that's highly symbolic of the state of state of the art, if you like, and from the point of view of corporations, big pharma. And uh, big pharma is extremely closely linked, you know, with big uh, war machine and it's extremely close to link with big oil and it's extremely close to link to big banking and the point that I'm usually making in my essays is for people to step back far enough to see that this is one cabal. It's not separate people doing things and running into each other and getting angry and all this. They're all working at the top, at the very top end. They're all working together at uh, places like the Bilderberg, you know, the secret society meetings that happen every year. Uh, and that, those are the people who are setting the agenda continuously. And what I'm constantly saying is, look, that's just, you know, 0.5%. And uh, we are 99.5%. You know, we the people. And we can take over. But we have to believe in ourselves and we have to train ourselves to be disciplined and responsible and caring and really caring about the planet and about each other. And if we can do that and develop that type of attitude, and it's got the spiritual component built into it too, obviously, we can't leave that out, it's very, very important. We can take over and we can rid the world of this horror story at the moment. And there's just far too much pacifistic uh, background chat about the state of the planet and not nearly enough action on the ground, in my view. So I'm pretty passionate in my writing, urging people to step up and uh, be counted. In, in, in the process of uh, being counted, I think sometimes that's a tricky thing because some people I've, I've met and spoken with who are well-versed, well they, they've just dropped out of politics, they don't vote, they're frustrated um, for good reason. And, you know, I think it can be a balancing act. How, how do you implement change? But I'm curious... On the the you know in the Western world, are there politicians or even parties that you say, uh, you know, they're not perfect, of course, but I kind of like the direction they're doing. Like, for example, have you had any? Uh, um, do you have a favorable view of you uh, UKIP in in uh, in the UK or uh, I don't know the Five Star Movement in Italy? War Trump yes. is is certainly uh, the the main thing that everyone talks about um, and has done for for at least the last fifteen months. Well, um, is it called Podnios or something name like that in in Spain as well? Uh, well, I favour are usually these sort of parties, but you know that it's only because there's a, there's a number of a few things which they're standing up and shouting about and being very articulate like Nigel Farage, is an extraordinary orator, and you see him standing up in the European Parliament and letting fly. It's, it's absolutely amazing. He, he, and it's very good value. And you think, wow, this guy could do something. But when you really explore his politics, actually, it's pretty bad news. You know, He's not interested in the environment. He's pro-GMO. He's not uh, making a big point about stopping selling arms to, to uh, Saudi Arabia or Syria or anywhere else and you know he's as bad as all the rest of them and unfortunately this is my experience which is why I come back to we the people and say look you know we start our ball game on another pitch turn your back for a moment not completely because we've got to stop worse stuff from happening you've got to put up the hand you've got to stop so it's pretty time consuming but where you can find the time turn your back on this and let's start our own game at the regional and local level. Let's simply develop a people's movement, which will gain in popularity because it'll be highly pragmatic and it'll face up to the highly unpopular uh, acts which are forcing people to be ever more slavish. 
And those, pe those people's movements will actually ultimately form governments, not the same sort of government we have at the moment, but they will form government because they are, people in them will approve themselves to be capable managers, <laughs> responsible people, loving people. Whereas those who stand for office have never proved themselves to be that. In fact, the great majority of them have proved themselves to be business tycoons in one way or another and should never have been elected. And so, you know, it is, I'm talking about a pretty radical scenario, but I see signs of it happening all over the world, and it's very encouraging. Uh, we are starting such a movement here in Poland, would you believe? That's just one more thing I'm getting involved with, amongst just a few colleagues at the moment, but we're laying the ground for starting a people's movement here. And, uh, you know, it's very exciting, really, because we've got to take our destiny into our own hands. It's very intoxicating watching the show go on with Trump and all the rest, but it's a waste of our energy if we don't get along and start our own, which will oppose that horror. And, and uh, so on that note, would you, do you vote? Are you someone who goes and uh, uh, holds your nose and pulls the lever for the, the, <laughs> the, the, uh, the least uh, bad of the group? Or, you know, yes, I, 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 do, I do vote for the least bad. Uh, I do, I do vote for the least bad because, you know, I, I believe you've still got to do that until the whole thing collapses. We've still got to do that. It, it's only responsible really to take that step. We're in the status quo and most of us got two feet in it. Some of us have got one foot in something else, but we, we, we've got to mitigate circumstances as best we can and prevent, for instance, the likelihood of a nuclear war. For instance, I was much more favorable to Trump than I was to uh, Clinton, because I noted that Clinton was showing absolute determination to push the button at the slightest provocation from anything in the Middle East, and particularly from Russia. Whereas I didn't see Trump was interested in doing that. I saw Trump was rather interested in making friends with Putin. It seemed quite bizarre, considering the degree to which the uh, pressure on citizens to comply with the idea that this, the Russia is the source of all evil, you know, and Putin is, of course, the great devil himself. Uh, it was pretty remarkable that Trump stood up and said, no, no I don't think that. I, I, I quite like the guy. I think we should meet up. And this is where I, he scores, in my view. But in certain other areas, he certainly doesn't. And, you know, this is the whole trouble with politics. <laughs> uh, yes, it's, it's, it's um, hardly ever perfect, uh, to say the least. The... Um... Well, you know, I I think we're we we're, we're going to talk twenty minutes when we've talked forty minutes. Um, maybe we should uh, <laughs> just give you a chance to talk about your your last book. I know you're working on another book, but in defense of life, uh, we re recently put up a review of that uh, at Connor Post. Uh, but it's an interesting book because it it um, well one it talks about your experiences with small farms in Poland, uh, but it also puts forward. Uh, kind of a, a series of essays, a, a game plan about um, what could be done or what could be different. And yes. uh, what would you like to say about that? Maybe kind of just a... a, a, a... Well, Go ahead. You've summarized, you summarized it very well. Uh, essentially, it is exactly what you said. It's a series of essays based on my experiences largely in the last uh, 20, 30 years, but also my vision of the way forward, similar to the, what we've just been discussing. And uh, I think you did a very interesting, nice review of it. And um, I hope people will be interested in, in purchasing this book because it does combine looking at the bigger picture with also putting together a lot of things which are normally kept separate. For instance, you know, I deal with the issue of health and the environment and food and war and economics and politics and you name it, and I look under the surface there and I link these different issues together and show people uh, how we can better understand what it is that's going on if we can see the thread, what I think David Icke calls joining the dots, uh, because that is the clue without which we're still subject to being divided and conquered. And, of course, this is a great tool of the power play to divide and conquer especially when people are showing signs of cohesion, unity, uh, supporting each other. They put someone in there who divides and conquers us. 
and we don't understand what happened or how it happened. So the book basically is a radical uh, look at the future and the present and past to a degree and brings a lot of stuff together which you might not find in other books. Yeah, it, and um, I can recommend it. It's uh, uh, just, just thinking about this divide and conquer, what I think is interesting too, since I was just in California for much of the last six months. There everyone's uh, very upset about this. Uh, that they, they had a, a, a mandatory vaccine law put through for people who send their children to school. Now you can still homeschool in California, and a lot, of, a lot more people do now. But when I, I spent time a lot with these homeschoolers and these uh, people who were vaccine skeptics, and they were so disillusioned, so many of them had been so confident that all they had to do was talk to the representatives and, you know, have heartfelt conversations and, and show, you know, introduce them to the sometimes uh, from vaccine uh, damage uh, children or parents who even lost children. And they, they, they were just flabbergasted that they, you know, they got all these yeses and, and of course we won't do that. And they turned around and it, it was so fast. Suddenly there was a law and it was mandated and, uh, it's you know these things are very very difficult. They're very sneaky. The globalists and and uh, big pharma and all those. And this is a horror story. And I knew I knew about that mandated uh, vaccination situation in the states, and you can't send your children to school. And it's and it's absolutely incredible. But that whole story on vaccinations is incredible. And anyone who is curious about it should do the research. And there's a lot of information out there now. And we're, of course, finding out more and more and more that there are very solid alternatives to being vaccinated and we'd be very wise to explore them fully and to adopt them because it's just another example of big pharma, big government. And actually, let's face it, you know, if you can keep people sick, you can make a lot of money because if they go and buy chemicals which they think are going to cure them or have vaccinations which they think are going to keep them safe against disease, you're always going to be in pocket to the tune of very many billions of dollars. So it's not in the interest of people who support globalism, the status quo of big business and corporations. It's not in their interest to really support the health of people. You have to be honest about that and simply say that's the fact. Yep. Yeah, and uh, and uh, maybe to wind it down, I'll mention that Julian Rose did uh, write one um, article covering vaccinations on the Connor Post. And one of the things I remember from that is just that uh, his experience with his uh, with his dairy farm, um, you know, dealing with cattle and dealing yeah. with masses of animals and, you know, how you see that there's ways to do things that just work a lot better and they're not reliant on big pharma, big agro, etc. That's exactly right. I mean, I... I put that in that article deliberately to make people aware that I learned by experience on my own farm that you simply don't need vaccinations or injections of any sort. And I had a very mixed farm. I had, you know, cattle, sheep, pigs, hens, everything. And it was organically run. And what happened was I, I observed the animals looked for in the field and in the hedgerows and on the tree branches that were low enough. They looked for what they needed to keep themselves healthy. And they had an extremely good instinct, much better than the human being's instinct. And if you could provide them with a very diverse uh, food supply, which nature, in fact, provides, I'm only saying we provide, but basically we help nature to provide it, those animals kept themselves totally free of the need for any of this intervention. We are animals, we are of a slightly higher species. We, can, we have exactly the same needs for good, diverse, high-quality foods, and we need to develop the instinct for which of those foods is going to be good for us. We simply don't need to follow the other route, but it's hard work for us because we've gone very far in the wrong direction, and we've become very addicted to the convenience, I, I, I might say, of pharmaceutical products. So, you know, one, one can't get out of this trap that easily, but one should start, and one should start today. I agree. The well, actually, I think this is a good time to uh, um, to end this. Uh, I'd certainly like to come back and have another podcast to talk about your perspectives on the UK 
a lot of our readers are in the UK. So that's always interesting, especially since you have this this perspective of working and living in Poland and as well working and living in the UK. And so you can compare the one to the other. Um, again, Julian Rose's uh, last book is In Defense of Life. Uh, you can get that at, I believe, Amazon or directly at his website is even better. And your website again, Julian, is? www.julianrose.info. Good. So with that, uh, it was great talking to you. And then I think I look forward certainly to another discussion about uh, the UK, if nothing else. That would be fine, James. Yeah, certainly. Great. Thank you. Thank you.